Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Before we begin, it's our tradition to go around the room and say our names. If I may, I'll begin. My name is Roy. Mike. Prasada Chita. Wally. Scott. Oh, my name is Harley. And my name is Michael. Baruch. I'm sorry, one more time? Susan. Thank you. Baruch. Baruch. My name is Cass. Joe. Eddie. Paul. Jose. Darcy. My name is Jerry. Chris. Jim. Carol. Ralph. Steve. I'm Bob. I'm Shantan. I'm Ray. I'm Doug. Hilda. My name is Tom. Jack. My name is Jerry. My name is David. I'm Casey. Mark. <coughs> I'm Oswaldo. Jim. I'm Hal. Peter. I'm <coughs> Nathan. Jim. Joe. I think that's everyone. Our speaker today is David Lewis. David has been a member of the Gay Buddhist Fellowship for over five years. He has a degree in comparative religious studies and has been a Dharma practitioner for over 40 years, first in the Vajrayana tradition and more recently in the Vipassana tradition. He's a graduate of the Spirit Rock Meditation Center's dedicated practitioners program and shares the Dharma at several sanghas in the Bay Area. Welcome, David. Thank you. <clears throat> Over 40 years, but I'm still a beginner. <laughs> um, and I really enjoy uh, beginner's mind. It's an important concept in, in Buddhist practice and meditation practice, <clears throat> especially in the, Zen, in the Zen tradition. And what, So one of the things I enjoy, um, even more than giving Dharma talks, is... Uh, <clears throat> teaching beginners classes, and facilitating beginners classes, because there, there tends to be a really fresh perspective from people that are just starting out meditating. One of the things that I uh, often hear from beginners, uh, and sometimes more experienced meditators, is uh, the comment, I'm not doing it right, or, uh, I, I, I think I'm getting it wrong, meditating. And I just actually heard this in the last week from somebody. Uh, a few days ago, somebody said, I think I'm just doing this wrong after we had a sit. And then this guy went on to describe in the most exquisite and perfect detail of exactly what his experience was. Uh, he'd been very mindful and uh, was, was really paying attention and could describe, you know, hearing different sounds at the same time and having thoughts intrude and things moving to the front burner of his consciousness and then back to the back burner. And it was just exquisitely perfect, mindful uh, description of his experience. So he was getting it right. He was doing exactly what we do in mindfulness practice. Uh, but because he had this idea that meditation was supposed to be about tranquility, um, he, he had ideas uh, about what meditation was uh, that were a little bit different than his direct experience. So that's what I'd kind of like to talk about today is uh, direct experience and meditation practice and see if we can let go of some of our ideas about um, what it's supposed to be and what we hope for and what we hope to get rid of or what we hope to uh, add on to our experience. So I just I want to encourage people in your own practice to um, try to steer away from getting something out of meditation practice and try to pay attention to whatever's going on right now. Nothing left out, even the hard stuff. The Zen master Dogen, who lived about 800 years ago, uh, 
Uh, someone asked him about what, medita- what enlightenment was, asked for his definition of enlightenment, and he had many different <coughs> answers to that question. But in, in one particular instance, he said, he responded, suddenly he was intimate. Suddenly he was intimate. So uh, that's my topic today, is intimacy. The Buddha taught us to discover for ourselves what the truth is. And in doing so, he didn't, in saying that, he wasn't suggesting that we listen to a teacher and then compare it with other teachers that we heard or that we read a book and compare it to other thought processes. The Buddha was suggesting that we pay attention to our direct experience and see what comes up, free of ideas and concepts, just direct experience. Not thinking, not studying, not judging, not listening to teachers. Check it out for yourself. It's something that in our modern American culture we don't do a whole lot. We're pretty good at um, looking at screens and watching TV and checking our iPhones and checking the computer, reading emails, reading books and thinking about concepts. And it seems like the more distractions we have available to us, the less we're in touch with our direct experience. This is not direct experience. <laughs> Unless you're doing it like I am, that's direct experience. Thumbs moving. Mary Oliver, the poet, says, there is nothing in this world, if I can pay attention to it, that doesn't cease to foster wonder and love. If there is something, I haven't found it yet. And in her poem, Messenger, she says, My work is loving the world. Here the sunflower, there the hummingbird. Here the quickening yeast, there the blue plums. Here the clam deep in the speckled sand. Are my boots old? Is my coat torn? Am I no longer young and still not half perfect? Let me keep my mind on what matters, which is mostly standing still and learning to be astonished. Mary Oliver's encouraging us to foster an attitude of interest, curiosity, paying attention, openness, receptivity to everything. If there is something, I haven't found it yet. Nothing excluded. Henry Miller also uh, spoke on this subject. Henry Miller says, the moment that one gives close attention to anything, even a blade of grass, it becomes a mysterious, awesome, indescribably magnificent world in itself. This is something that artists know uh, quite a bit about. This is what artists do. If any of you are artists, you know about it. Again, Henry Miller says, to paint is to love again, to live again, to see again. I remember well the transformation which took place in me when first I began to view the world with the eyes of a painter. The most familiar things, objects which I had gazed at all my life, now become an enduring source of wonder. And with wonder, of course, affection. A teapot an old hammer, a chipped cup. Whatever came to hand, I looked upon as if I had never seen it before. And one more quote on this subject from George Washington Carver, the botanist and activist. Um, Someone asked him about healing sick plants, how he did it. And Carver said, if you listen to things and love them, they will reveal themselves to you. So this is the attitude of um, of openness and of receptivity that we try to bring to our meditation practice. If you have a mindfulness practice or if you strive towards that. We try to be uh, intimate with our minds, with our bodies, with our breath, with our feelings, with whatever the focus of your meditation is. And that might change during the course of a a sitting and that might change during the course of a day and that might change many times during the course of a life. 
But that's the attitude of openness that we bring to our meditation practice. So when we think of this idea of intimacy, the word intimacy, what comes up? And usually what we think about when we talk about intimacy is our relation to another human being. And that's another kind of intimacy, a very beautiful intimacy. And sometimes it's kind of a scary intimacy. I know that as a gay man that was raised in a kind of Calvinist Protestant household in a small town in the Midwest, that intimacy was not uh, encouraged in my upbringing. Uh, my family didn't hug. I didn't learn about hugging until I, until I was in college, until I went away from home. Um, and, and being gay and having ideas of intimacy with other men, I mean, that, you know, I didn't even, even have words for talking about that. So I think it's an issue for a lot of gay men, a lot of gay people. It's an issue for a lot of people generally. It's a question of intimacy with other people. Do, do you all know who Byron Katie is? Have you heard that name? Mm-hmm. Erin Cady is a, a, a wonderful teacher. She's a woman. Byron is a, a woman's name in this case. And she, um, she's a writer. She's written a bunch of books. And she had a sudden awakening experience, which doesn't happen all that often. Usually the kind of awakening we talk about in Buddhism and meditation practice is something that happens very gradually over time. Most generally, that's the way it works. But every once in a while, someone has a very sudden awakening experience. And Byron Katie did, and she talks about it. And one of the things she um, has talked about in her experience is that after this awakening experience, she kind of, in the, in the words of Dogen, she became intimate with all things and with all people. And she uh, had a husband who she loved very much, and he loved her. And they had a wonderful relationship. And after this awakening, it became a whole lot more wonderful. But after a while, her husband started to notice that this wonderful, loving, luminescent, radiant woman that he was married to was that way with everybody. It was disconcerting. Another person that's been described in this way, and you might have heard it, is the Dalai Lama. Is anyone that's met the Dalai Lama or been in his presence gets this feeling that they're his oldest, best friend. And the Dalai Lama has this ability to totally connect with whoever is sitting in front of him. So if he's having an audience of, of meeting a couple of dozen people in a session, he can go from... from deep grief talking to someone that has lost their family in the genocide in Tibet to to joy and happiness of somebody that has something good to report to him in the course of three minutes, back and forth. A man named Charles Cutler uh, interviewed the Dalai Lama quite extensively in the book about him. And uh, this is what Charles Cutler has to say about the kind of intimacy the Dalai Lama represents. All of us have the capacity to seek intimacy in many more forms than we are currently aware of. In this very moment, we have vast resources of intimacy available to us. Intimacy is all around us. If what we seek in life is happiness, and if intimacy is an important ingredient of a happier life, then it clearly makes sense to conduct our lives on the basis of a model of intimacy that includes as many forms of connection with others as possible. (coughs) So intimacy is a practice, like meditation is a practice. It's about being connected to our experience in an open way, moment to moment. And one of the things that that fosters is a sense that we're connected to all beings and all life, all sentient beings. Sentient means uh, uh, having desires, avoiding pain. And this is true of ants, mice, slugs. They have desires. They want us, and they have a survival instinct. They want to avoid pain. They want to be happy. They want to protect their family. They want to feed, just like us. 
intimacy even for people and creatures that we might not be sympathetic with, that are sometimes difficult. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow said, if we could read the secret history of our enemies, we should find in each person's life sorrow and suffering enough. Meaning if we kind of were able to see inside the heart of people that we really have problems with, uh, there's something to sympathize with there or empathize with or understand. And in the same way, um, we're encouraged to be intimate with our own dark side, with our shadow. And getting back to meditation practice, this is something that, that sometimes comes up for people and they talk to me about um, really having difficulty with. Uh, they're trying to sit quietly, they're trying to be tranquil, especially in a long retreat. Stuff comes up. Our, our childhood um, traumas, our lifelong habits, the stuff of the, about ourselves that we don't particularly like, we're not particularly proud of, that stuff comes up when we get quiet enough. And that's what's supposed to happen. Because it's when we face our stuff when it comes up and are able to work with it and not turn away from it and not avoid it, uh, that we can finally start to get a handle on it and realize it's just our stuff. It comes and goes like everything else. So our practice is to turn away from those parts of ourselves that that we're uncomfortable, not to turn away from the parts of ourselves that we're uncomfortable with, but rather to turn toward it, as well as turning towards our joy and happiness. That's our practice. And we all have those perks. Here's how Thich Nhat Hanh talks about it in a poem called Call Me By My True Names. You may know it. Do not say I'll depart tomorrow because even today I still arrive. Look deeply, I arrive in every second to be a bud on a spring spring branch, to be a tiny bird with wings still fragile, learning to sing in my new nest, to be a caterpillar in the heart of a flower, to be a jewel hiding itself in a stone. I still arrive in order to laugh and to cry, in order to fear and to hope, The rhythm of my heart is the birth and death of all that are alive. I am the mayfly metamorphizing on the surface of the river, and I am the bird which, when spring comes, arrives in time to eat the mayfly. I am the frog swimming happily in a clear pond, and I'm also the grass snake who, approaching in silence, feeds itself on the frog. I am a child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks, and I am the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I am a 12-year-old girl, refugee in a small boat, who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate. And I am the pirate, my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. My joy is like spring, so warm it makes flowers bloom in all walks of life. My pain is like a river of tears, so full it fills the four oceans. Please call me by my true names. I can hear all my cries and laughs at once. I can see that my joy and pain are one. Please call me by my true names so I can wake up and so the door of my heart can be left open, the door of compassion. And that was Thich Nhat Hanh. Talking about these different sides of ourselves, the, the beautiful and the ugly existing together. When we meditate, those, those both come up. They come together. And our job in our meditation practice is to simply watch that process happening without judgment, without trying to get rid of the bad stuff and trying to grasp on to the good stuff, to just watch it happen and understand what our true name is. A um, 
Japanese poet named Izumi Shik Shikibu. Izumi, Izumi Shikibu. I always have trouble with that name. Who lived about a thousand years ago. Said it like this, and you've probably heard this because Buddhist teachers love this very short little poem. Watching the moon at dawn, solitary, mid-sky, I knew myself completely. No part left out. No part left out. So, I can't em emphasize anything more strongly than that no part left out. Because that's our inclination, our habit, is to leave out the parts that we don't want to face, that we don't want to deal with. We need to practice letting go of our concepts of ourselves, our idea of what we're supposed to be, or what we want to be, as opposed to who we simply are. And likewise, practice in our meditation practice, uh, simply experiencing our direct experience and not the way we think it's supposed to be, or the way we would like it to be. That's where freedom is found. No part left out. Uh, John James Audubon, the bird illustrator, American, great American bird illustrator, said, if you see a difference, if you notice a difference between the bird you're looking at and the one in the guidebook, believe the bird. So our meditation practice invites us to observe this process, this process of stuff coming up, coming up, passing, going away. Meditation is simply the process of showing up and paying attention. That's all it is. Couldn't be more simple. We make it more complicated, but it's simply showing up, paying attention to what it what is. I heard a meditation instruction, and now I'm not remembering who gives this instruction. It might come to me or someone might be able to help me, but uh, maybe it was Ajahn Chah said, it's the simplest instruction in the world. How do you meditate? You get a chair, you put it in the middle of the room, sit on it, see who shows up. Simply showing up. So once again, Zen Master Dogen, we'd end with him. I started with him and I'll end with him. Zen Master Dogen says, seeing with the whole body and mind, hearing with the whole body and mind, one understands intimately. No part left out. So with that, um, that's enough talking for me. I'm kind of interested in opening it up and seeing what your uh, comments and experiences, or whether you have any um, anything to say about intimacy or or your meditation practice. Yeah, Tom. So um, thank you. This was really uh, a lot of great information. I was just reading this morning from uh, Philip Moffat talking about integrating his meditation practice with a physical practice, um, qigong, yoga, things like that, to heighten the awareness of the body. And you just, as you closed, you said, you know, the body and the mind. So it, it seems to me the majority of what I hear in talks in the Dharma is talking about being aware of your body as you meditate the painful knee, you know, all this. But I don't hear much said about, you know, having like an actual physical practice that you merge with um, or to accompany your meditation. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, your experience or recommendations around that? Sure. Um, yeah, you do hear a lot of Buddhist teachers talking about the body. Um, right. And that's because the Buddha talked a lot about the body. He said, I'm not going to be able to remember this verbatim, but in this fathom-long body, the Buddha said, in this fathom-long body, everything you need to know. 
You don't have to go outside your body, but he's basically saying practice with your body. In my experience, and especially when I'm um, teaching meditation, is, is I very often say that if you want to get out of your head, which a lot of people come to meditation because they want to um, find tranquility or get out of their busy mind or some, somehow bypass this stuff that's going on in their head. If you want to get out of your head, get into your body. So an awful lot of, of meditation practices of, of all the different traditions are, are body-based. And in fact, the Satipatthana Sutta, which is um, one of the, the Buddha's primary teaching suttas, um, starts out with a focus on the body, um, mindfulness of the body. And uh, likewise, the Anapanasati Sutta, which is the, the, the very famous teaching the Buddha gave about um, awareness of breath, which is a very common um, focus of meditation, it's, it's all about the breath, which is, of course, part of your body. So, for me, it doesn't matter whether you're doing qigong or, or yoga or, or have some kind of formal body-based practice or whether you're simply sitting on a cushion paying attention to your body. If you're paying attention to what's going on in your body, um, that is more of a direct experience than thinking about some concept in your head or even thinking about the concept of your body in your head. So this idea of direct experience is, is, is terribly important in, in Buddhism. It's, it's about experiencing whatever is going on right now and you can only do that through your five senses. You have available to you your five senses to, to, for direct experience. Anything outside of that, thinking about the future, thinking about past, worrying, philosophizing, having concepts, that's, you know, thought processes going on. And the Buddha, to, um, I shouldn't leave this out, the Buddha um, actually talked about six senses, and this, the sixth sense was, was um, thinking. And this gets a little bit confusing for people, because it's not thinking about, it's not philosophizing thinking, it's about just seeing your thoughts flowing through as they flow through in the same way that you see your breath. When we sit in meditation practice and, and pay attention to our breath, it's just in-breath, out-breath, short breath, long breath, whatever your breath is doing is your direct experience. If you're choosing to use your thoughts as a, as a um, focus of your meditation, it's thoughts arising, thoughts passing away. They're just like clouds passing through a, a clear blue sky. We don't grasp onto them. So, uh, yes, it's all about the body, and that can mean a lot of different things. It could include a lot of different practices. Yeah, as Waldo. I was, uh, when you started talking about sentient beings, uh, what came to mind, uh, the most recent uh, awareness I had of that, was uh, I was on vacation, I was laying down, and I a uh, lounge chair, face down, getting some sun, looking at the grass. And there was the tiniest of little ants, smaller than, because it's in Hawaii, smaller than the ones you see around here. And that followed its trajectory um, over the course of a, a few seconds, you know, going up and down. Going this way, that way, backtracking, doing this, doing that. <coughs> it's the whole world that was happening, rather than like, you know, just a few inches away. Yeah. And of course, it continues to happen. Yeah. Multiplied by zillions. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's and beautiful. It was right there, you know, a little movement of my finger moving one of the blades of grass caused the avoidance of danger or, yeah. danger or whatever. Yeah. That little creature. Uh, yeah. It caught my attention. It's very interesting. Yeah. Experience. That's why we Buddhists tend to look kind of silly trying to get, you know, a spider out of the, the drain and. and Safely out the back door without, you know, just smashing it because you know the spider's just trying to feed his family or save itself. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Did somebody wants to ask the Dalai Lama if he had any regrets in his life? And he thought about it for a while and he said, "There's been a few mosquitoes." many <laughs> spiders. <laughs> Yes. I was thinking about your two major themes of meditation and intimacy, and for me, and maybe you might want to expound on this, 
expand on it, but when I think about the key or the essence of meditation, mm -hmm. for me it's establishing that intimate connection within myself at a very, very deep level. And I feel like most of the time I'm just scratching the surface, just barely. And when I went on the GBF retreat last year, I had an opportunity to go much deeper, much, much deeper. And for me, if there is a soul, it's being intimate. And in many religions, I'm Jewish, and in, in my religion, we often talk about the intimate relationship with the soul. Yeah. And I wonder if you might want to comment on that. Yeah, well, that's you said it beautifully. Um, a, it's, it's it's a great thing to go on a retreat, so because you really do go deeper. Um, and and B, it's a universal thing. To best of my knowledge, in all religions, it's a universal thing. This this intimacy and in in Christian meditation traditions, it's about opening yourself to God. It's, it's when you when you. You let go of your thoughts and ideas and, and grasping and get really quiet and meditate, then you, you directly experience God. So it's, um, yes, it's a universal thing and, and uh, go on retreats. I know GBF has one coming up, so it's an opportunity. Yeah, great. Thank you, David, for a very rich uh, talk. I appreciate your integrating poetry with uh, ideas of putting more thought into the scene. I was uh, thinking about one of the early uh, Zen masters said, not knowing is most intimate. And uh, it's, to me, that's a great reminder that, you know, if I go into something thinking I know, like having an idea about what my meditation is supposed to be, then I'm shutting off intimacy. Yeah. I'm shutting off learning. Yeah. So not knowing is like opening my mind to learning yeah. and being aware and paying attention, paying attention. Yeah, beautiful. That's that's um that that's so true. And and it's true for ourselves too. As soon as we have this idea of ourselves, who I am and what I'm about, then we kind of close a lot of doors as to what, what's actually going on. And it's true for other people as well. As soon as we have an idea about you know who you are and what you're all about, then uh, we're closing doors to what, what actually... Sometimes when you name things, it's it puts that thing in a box. So thank you for that. That's a beautiful um, adjunct. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I know you were talking about shadow. Being intimate with the shadow. Um, once in, in Canada, I was on some, I was tripping on something, and um, I went to the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and I wasn't in there. It was, it was, you know, some monstrous person at night. And I, and I fled and I said, well, maybe I should go back. And for the next two hours, there was just a parade of monsters through my through my eyes. Um, pirates and rapists and killers and just scoundrels of all sorts. And it was absolutely fascinating to see my face be the host to all of this range of squalid character. And um, would you have a sense about what, what that might be? Uh, are we just connected to the whole range of human options or or it might just be past lives or unexplored options of this. I mean, I just... What, what's your take on where this capacity for monstrosity comes from? Just, I, I know it's... it's uh, well, we all got it. I mean, for, for me, it's... Um, I won't even go to past lives. Right. Um, but for me, it's all about life habits and my conditioning and stuff that I've lived, the stuff that I've learned through the, 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 the course of a, a long life, a lot of which is self-critical. Mm -hmm. And that stuff still comes up for me uh, all the time. And, um, and I, I, I don't think it's so much an aberration. I think, I think you know, sometimes we 
I could give a whole talk on this, uh, on another Buddhist concept called uh, Sakaya Diddy, which is self-view. Um, it's another really important concept, and it's and the, and the Buddha taught Sakaya Diddy self-view as uh, it, it's about how we look at ourselves and how we define ourselves. And sometimes we see ourselves as monsters, and sometimes we see ourselves as geniuses, and sometimes we see, see ourselves as a good Buddhist, or a bad meditator, or a reliable friend, or a gay person. Um, some of which may be true, and some of which may not be true. Uh, but the Buddha said, watch out for Sakaya Diddy, watch out for this, for this self-view, because, um, again, it's, it's what Bray was talking about, it's putting yourself in a box by, by defining yourself. And there are people, that, uh, and, and this is a better subject for people in the mental health profession, the people that, you know, kind of spend their lives seeing themselves as a monster. Not necessarily true. So I think probably a lot of us can recognize that. I certainly can. It's a, it comes up for me as I think, oh, you know, right now I might be thinking I'm not, but sometimes I do. I think, what am I doing sitting up here giving a Dharma talk? Who am I? <laughs> you know, that's, that's a self-fuel. Or I could be sitting here thinking, I'm giving a really good Dharma talk, good for me. That's a self-fuel. That's just, you know, neither of them mean anything. So... For me, that, that stuff coming up is my conditioning, my past, the things, that, the, the lessons that I've learned from my childhood and my parents and my upbringing, and uh, I take it with a grain of salt because I realize, fortunately, through meditation practice and seeing things come and go, I can I understand a lot of that stuff that I tell myself is not true. So when the monster arises sometimes, I can just say, oh, hi, monster. <laughs> it's... Uh, as, as Buddha said, hello Mara, invited in for a cup of tea. It's like, okay, monster's here, and monster will leave in, in monster's time. So I, I don't know if that's how, that was kind of yes, rambling. Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you. Will you give a talk on that? Can we book Sakai you? Did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a really juicy one. So yeah. you, you know, we think about self, you know, I, I would, Oh, I just want to go there. You know, think about gay. What does gay mean? What does gay really mean? What does gay community mean? How does that make me different than other people? How does that separate me from other people? How does that make me part of this community or not? Um, listening to all the images of nature and so forth, I think this, you know, intimacy thing, well, it's easy. But it occurs to me there's some aspects of uh, modern-day life that one may be shouldn't be intimate with. And I'll give the example of uh, The Dark Knight Rises, the movie that opened up in the last few days. Some of these current movies do everything to prevent you from coming in. I mean, the fast editing, the loud noises, the content. I mean, I can look at a movie and, and look at its artistic aspects, but this is a movie I think I'll choose to avoid. Um, I don't wonder if there are some aspects and there's some conditions which it's not, I'm not just saying that to deny that it exists, but to actually engage in the experience is perhaps detrimental. Yeah, I agree with you. There's, but we have so many choices in life. I mean, every moment of every day, it's like, what am I going to pay attention to? What am I not going to be paying? What am I not going to pay attention to? Um, so we're always making these choices, and and yeah, there's stuff that's hard to be intimate with, and that's you know technology and, and violence and loud noise, and um, and there are ways also to be intimate with it in a strange sort of way. Um, I wasn't intending to go there, but you just reminded me because you mentioned the Dark Knight, and there, 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 a whole bunch of people got killed at that movie in Colorado, and it's on many of our minds. And one of the places my mind went, um, and is still going around that, is what kind of terrible suffering did that gunman experience before he did what he did? What kind of life did he have? What led him to do such a thing? And I actually, I have some empathy or some, not empathy, I have sympathy 
for somebody that I'm kind of assuming suffered terribly. And one of the first places my mind went, and I was just speculating, thought maybe this is a soldier with PTSD, or maybe this is someone with a mental health problem that didn't get addressed by the by the system. It's, it's not being taken care of. So there's there's ways to even open open your heart to to someone like that. You know, like that Longfellow quote is you use you know if you can look into somebody's heart, you see, um, you, you see the suffering that's there. And that can be, um, when Brooke and I were here a few months ago, we talked about meta practice. And, and it, 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 Buddhism often has a practice to deal with whatever comes up. Almost any condition that, or, or thought or, or obsession or meditation problem that co- comes up, there's an answer for it someplace in the, in the suttas. The Buddha taught for 40 years, he had a lot of answers. But meta is one of those answers. It's when things are scary and violent and, and, and upsetting. <clears throat> Oh, you can do meta. You can send meta. Meta loving kindness practice. Anybody else reflections? Yeah. Um, I'm still wrestling a little bit with the direct experience and the, this not being direct experience. Yeah. Um, because it seems like this and and the connections that are possible through you know technology and uh, are in some ways you can connect with people and have an intimate experience and be really with them and experience them uh, through <coughs> through that technology through that medium as and it seems to me that that's, that's as valid as like um, experiencing sound through the medium of air, and so uh, is is it that direct experience is just a receptive um, condition, or I'm just wondering if you know why we the connection that we experience through a technology through a network or something is is not as valid something physical because it's disembodied or something. Yeah, because it's disembodied is a is a is a good point. It, I, I guess I'm struggling with whether it's as valid or not. I find it problematic only because I would rather if I'm if I'm um, relating to somebody, I would rather be sitting face to face and looking into their eyes and speaking to them directly as opposed to sending them emails. And it's not that emails are bad. Um, it's, it's just that I would rather have the direct experience of, of, of being embodied with them. Um, so I guess it is kind of on a, on a, on a scale. Um, but there are many things, and I, I gave a talk here maybe a year ago where um, kind of a similar thing came up. I was Because I'm really into this direct experience thing. And, and um, somebody mentioned that that reading or listening to music is a, is a is their favorite direct experience, and from a meditation standpoint, standpoint, and I I love to read as much as anything. It's my primary um, kind of enjoyment of using my mind. But from a meditation experience, or from a direct experience experience, when I reading, looking at this, this is a white sheet of paper with some symbols on it. That, um, that are kind of scattered around on one side of the page and light reflects off of it. That's the direct experience. But once my mind starts interpreting those symbols and giving understanding words and recognizing words and, and putting together concepts, I've gotten away from the direct, direct experience. Now I'm thinking. Now I'm using my mind. And it's not that, I mean, you know, I'm not here saying that there's anything wrong with thinking. I'm just saying that when we do, when we practice meditation, we try to simplify that experience. We try to keep moving back and simplify our experience so we get down to um, simply perceiving light on paper or simply perceiving sounds passing through. I mean, right now, if you chose to, you could close your eyes and, and, and meditate and just have the sound of my voice being a sound that passes right through you without registering in your brain and without, you know, it could be, you know, rain on a window. 
it's just another sound passing through you. And that's the kind of direct experience we, we aim for in meditation. It's not to say that, that reading or conversation are bad things. It's just a different experience. Is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah, Susan. Can I, can I just add something sure. to that briefly? Um, I, what I found, and I work with a lot of kids, is that the, I'll say, a problem involved in texting or emailing or those sorts of communication is that they're fraught with opportunities for projection and misinterpretation. And I think that's where the gap is. If you really, I think if you really know someone well that you're communicating with in that way, you're almost good, but it's too easy to get scared or you know, get worried about something like that because there's no nuance and there's no explanation. I think that, that to me is the biggest problem with it. It's just too, it can be too confusing. Yeah. yeah, but at the same time, many people express um, themselves very clearly through technology, sure. actually better than they do person to person. So I um, appreciate you bringing this up, Kat, because I'm reminded I'm like, I, I was with, driving over here with Philip today, and um, this woman was texting, and she was walking across the <laughs> crosswalk, and you know, we could have easily hit her, and she was totally oblivious. So. You're reminding me of the whole idea of, okay, um, you know, I could be totally engaged with someone, you know, doing an email or texting or what have you, but how, how engaged am I in the moment, in this reality, in the physical reality, you know, am I jeopardizing my life crossing that crosswalk because I'm totally oblivious, you know, to the fact that someone may not may, you know, drive through the red light or a stop sign and hit me. So it's interesting because it reminds me of the thoughts that we have in our head, or I'll speak for myself, that I oftentimes have. I, I'm process-oriented. And I think it's, I see a lot of value to that, but at, at other times, I am not engaging in my world, you know? Yeah. I can, I, that can get in the way of me having direct contact with people or with the experiences I'm having. So I'm just thinking it's this, you know, finding that balance. Having, you know. Thank you, that's beautiful. Yeah. But it's, it's something to be mindful of. Yeah. Whether we're doing one or the other, it's just something we, that they're both worth being mindful of. David, I have, oh, I have to be mindful of the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's your birthday. <laughs> one o'clock. Um, thank you so much. Will you be able to stay for the yeah, social course. time? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, David, for, for coming. My pleasure. Book him soon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> how about <did he? laughs> How about announcements today? Um, Jerry Jones. Okay. Thanks, David, for coming. Uh, next week, I'm going to read this. I don't think John Coleman's been here before, and he's going to be our speaker. John Coleman is a Jesuit priest and associate pastor at St. Ignatius Church in San Francisco. He holds a doctorate in sociology, sociology from the University of California, Berkeley, where he specializes in the sociology of religion. As a Jesuit, he is naturally interested in spirituality and its practices. Thank you. Our host. I'm your host today. So let's see the regular announcements. There are snacks and treats on the table. There's tea and cups. Uh, if you use a cup for tea, please be sure to wash it and put it in the rack to dry. There is, uh, I'll be going around with the Donna Bowl. Suggested donation is five to eight dollars more if you're able. Um, there's a, if you're new and you want to be on the mailing list, there's a sign up sheet. Please leave, put on your physical and email address. And after, uh, the social, a number of people often meet at the front door at 12.30 to go out to lunch. Thank you. Michael? Uh, speaking of retreats and going deeper, uh, the, the GBF annual retreat is indeed uh, coming up. It's the third, uh, fourth weekend in September. Check out the brochure on the table uh, and registration form. Uh, Jerry Jones, who's handling registration, just informed me there are only 10 spaces left before we're full. Uh, if you have any questions about it, feel free to ask me. And uh, there is scholarship money available, so if money is a concern, 
uh, but the procedure for scholarships is enumerated in the brochure. So thank you. Hey, yeah, I'd like to just add uh, to what Jerry said about next week's speaker, John Coleman. He's, he's going to focus on talking about Thomas Merton, who was a uh, Catholic monk who was very influenced by Buddhism and saw himself compromised to a Zen Buddhist uh, monk. So that's a part of the talk. Oh, okay. the, Trappist, the Trappist monk, and the Trappists are currently very involved with um, cross uh, religious dialogue. They continue to be since Merton's time. Oh, great. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you once again. Let's go ahead and stand for our dedication of merit. <laughs> truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness, may all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow, may all never be separated from the sacred happiness which is without sorrow, and may all live in equanimity without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Dedication, GBF dedication of merit. Thank you, everyone, for today. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.